And finally, a little demonstration example where we're constructing a non-trivial audio file in a way that doesn't actually use a single for loop, so in a very loop-free MATLAB style fashion. The goal here is to create an audio illusion, a little bit inspired by the pictures of the Dutch uh, painter M.C. Escher. You probably will have seen these many times, uh, where you get uh, a mix of two perspectives, such that a staircase uh, gives the illusion such that you can always go around in a circle on this staircase and only ever go upwards. Can we do something similar in an audio file where we can hear a continuous progression of an increasing uh, pitch, but it never stops. Whenever you listen to it a while later, the pitch is a bit higher and it goes up and up and up, but at the same time it doesn't really move anywhere. <clears throat> How can we create such an illusion? Um, the goal of the exercise is to create an audio file with uh, 12 sign tones of apparently continuously exponentially increasing frequency, but they actually never leave the frequency range of, for example, uh, 300 to 3400 hertz. That's roughly the frequency range that the telephone network can transmit, so you can uh, show someone the illusion through a telephone. And we do this by letting them wrap around the frequency interval, but such that it not, does not become obvious that when it has reached the top of the frequency interval, it just reappears at the bottom. We fade out the amplitude of each tone as it approaches the uh, top of the frequency range, and we fade it in again when it comes from the bottom. And for that, we use a raised cosine curve, basically just one period of a cosine flipped around such that it gives a, a curve like this. <clears throat> and the goal is to produce a, a two second long waveform in which each tone raises uh, one twelfth of this frequency range. And then we concatenate that into a 60 second long 16 bit WAV file with 16 kilohertz sampling rate. In order to avoid uh, hearing a click every two seconds, we also want to avoid phase jumps. So we want there to be an integer number of sine periods uh, for all these sine waves in uh, happening within two seconds. <coughs> so first let's write some uh, variables down with these parameters, our sampling frequency, the duration, the number of tones, and the minimum and maximum frequency. And this here is a spectrogram of the sound file as we expect it to look like. So this is a depiction of the frequency content of the file calculated using the Fourier transform applied on small windows throughout the file. This is the time axis, this is the frequency axis, and you can see here these 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 tones, and they go up in frequency exponentially. They become quieter as they reach uh, 3.4 kilohertz, and when they disappear here, then they fade in again from the bottom. <clears throat> Why do we use uh, exponential growth here? Because humans perceive frequency in an exponential-like fashion. That's why one octave, one doubling of frequency sounds like a similar frequency difference throughout the audio spectrum. So how do we do this? As you can see, no loop and only a very small number of lines, maybe one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight lines in total. The rest is just comments and input-output. Um, so first we define ourselves a vector for the time axis from zero to the duration minus one sample length because we started at zero with a step size one over the sampling frequency, that's the sampling period. And now we first create a 
matrix a uh, matrix as long as the number of samples that we need and as high as the number of tones we have um, and this matrix initially contains a normalized logarithm of the frequency of each tone why the logarithm because in the end we want a exponentially growing frequency so we allow the logarithm of the frequency to grow linearly and how do we do this we create in fact two matrices the first matrix um, each row is one uh, increases by one twelfth so you have at the <clears throat> at one end uh, the number zero and at the other end the number eleven twelfth and this is the uh, vertical vector and we make an uh, outer product with just a rows of ones as long as the two second recording that we want to produce and we add to this another outer product consisting of a, a vertical vector of ones and the time divided by uh, the length of the recording so this is along the horizontal axis this is a number that goes from zero to one whereas along the vertical axis we have a number that goes in 12 steps from zero to one we add up those two and then we do a modulus one which means if the sum goes above one we wrap it around we subtract one uh, in order to make sure all these values stay within the range zero to one so this is the <clears throat> logarithm of our frequency now we replace this with the actual frequency uh, to do this we calculate the ratio between the maximum and the minimum frequency and take it to the power of our logarithm normalized logarithm such that uh, we end up with a number between uh, one and that ratio and then we multiply that with the minimum frequency and that gives us a number that grows exponentially from the minimum frequency to the maximum frequency now we have the frequency if you integrate frequency you end up with phase the value that you can feed into a sine function so we're adding up all the frequencies uh, multiplied with 2 pi divided by uh, times the time of one sample which is the same as divided by the sampling frequency uh, and uh, we multiply with this value the cumulative sum we're adding up all the frequency so far and the frequency you can think of is the times 2 pi is the speed with which a point goes around a circle and the height that this point has is then the value of the sine function so this is our phase we could feed the phase directly into the sine function and this gives us all the tones that we want to add up but we have a little problem we still want to make sure that we end up with an integer number of um, phases so we look at what is the phase at the end here and we round the phase at the end divided by 2 pi to the nearest integer that's the phase that we want to have divided by the phase that we actually have that correction of the phase that we need for each row in that matrix we now convert into a diagonal matrix and multiply with the matrix of phases and that just applies exactly this phase correction such that the last row is phase continuous with the first row such that we can endlessly concatenate the resulting audio file now we calculate the sine value of each of our phases then we calculate this raised cosine function that causes the 
signal the sine waves to fade in and at the bottom frequency and fade out at the top frequency. So here again we feed the normalized logarithm from up here times 2 pi into a cosine and then we flip the cosine around by multiplying it with minus one half and subtract it from one half and that gives exactly that curve that starts at zero goes up to one and smoothly goes down back to zero and we multiply our 12 sine waves with this fading function sum them all up divide by two so we mix them and divide by sorry divide by 12 such that everything remains normalized in the range minus one to plus one then we repeat that matrix uh, here three times first so we get a six second long signal to plot the spectrogram that i've shown previously and then we multiply another 20 times to get the um, the 60 or probably in this case even 120 second long uh, audio file that we wanted to have and finally we write everything into a WAF file storing not only the waveform but also the sampling frequency and we specify we want to store 16-bit values per sample. How does it sound like? I won't demo it to you. I wanted to try it out in MATLAB yourself or if you prefer to re-implement uh, this program in NumPy or in Julia as you like. Um, a variant of this is a solution is also known as the Shepard Reset Glissando. It has a slight difference. Each tone is exactly one octave, a factor two in frequency uh, from the next. So one other exercise is to modify this program to actually match the specification of a Shepard Reset Glissando. And finally, to conclude the lecture, I've added here a nice uh, cheat sheet that I found online where someone gave a comparison of some of the linear algebra syntax between the MATLAB programming language, the Julia programming language, and the NumPy extension to Python. And there you can see that uh, Julia follows quite closely in its matrix notation what MATLAB does. Some things are a little bit easier, some things are a little bit uh, longer. The authors had slightly different preferences for how to make things uh, consistent, but overall if you're familiar with MATLAB you will not be entirely surprised by the linear algebra notation of Julia. Uh, NumPy has the problem that Python wasn't really designed for matrices as a built-in data type, so NumPy had to use the existing syntax and you get this much more object-oriented notation. You can't just uh, calculate matrix prime. You have to put a dot .t or dot .conjugate uh, method on the matrix object and many of the functions you have to import from a namespace mp dot and so on and you have to explicitly use a colon array function in order to construct an array where you can just use square brackets in MATLAB. But overall you can see many of the concepts are very similar. There's almost a one-to-one -one mapping between these facilities. Okay. Pick your language and I hope this will be a useful skill for you to be able to rapidly prototype numerical algorithms in courses, projects and so on.